All right, Father in heaven, Lord, we gather together this morning in your precious name. We thank you, God. You are the king of the universe, the master of everything. And Lord, we acknowledge you this morning. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our devotion. You are worthy of our surrender, our service, our dedication. And Lord, anything that you would lay upon us, anything that you would ask us, Lord, would not ever be considered a sacrifice, but it would be our pleasure and our honor to be given to you. Lord, we come to this place every week, several times in the week. And God, it is not our desire to come this morning just out of a ritual or out of a duty. Lord, we come in devotion and we come with hunger, hunger to hear from you, hunger to have another piece of the puzzle made clear to us. Lord, we want you to work in us. We want you to work through us. We want you to transform us and create in us holiness and true righteousness. So please, Spirit of God, in this day, please work in this body, in this assembly. We would pray, Lord, that you would be with the families that are away from us this weekend, the Rootsy family, Brother Jacob over in um, on the coast this weekend, the Coles back over in Montana, there are Episcopal family over on the coast as well. And Lord, those parts of our body that are absent from us traveling, we pray, God, that you would minister to them, the churches that they'll be in today. I pray that they'll be blessed by them. So, Lord, we lift our hearts and our soul to you today, yielding ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be what? Yeah. He'll tell you. Yeah, all right. Let's all stand to our feet, and we'll take, you should have music in front of you, scripture songs. If, if not everybody has it, I'm sorry, we were just a little bit late. But the first one that we'll be singing is Psalms 124, 8. That should be in your stack. will be Psalms 119, 105. one is Psalms 147 verse number one.
last one is Proverbs 13:20. may be seated. All right. If you give me one second to get right with my Lord. Good morning. Good morning to everybody. So, before we start... Our message, our last uh, class in our series, A Good Soldier of Jesus Christ. First off, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the fact that today is more Memorial Day. I don't find it uh, at all a coincidence that the, today's Memorial Day, given the subject matter of my class today. Um, one thing as a veteran I would like to point out on Memorial Day is please do not, on Memorial Day, go to a veteran and thank him for his service. Any veteran that has come home from the war, having lost a brother or sister or left a brother or sister overseas, will find it actually very insulting. Uh, Memorial Day is for those who did not come home. Right. Veterans Day is for us who did come home. If you want to do something for a veteran because they represent those individuals who did cast their lives on the altar of freedom, I would recommend that you would present the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to them. 22 veterans a day commit suicide because they're not receiving the proper mental health care because they have no hope in life. And that hope only comes from Jesus Christ. Um, so if you want to do something for our veterans, if you want to do something for those brothers and sisters who lost their lives overseas and went into eternity, help those brothers and sisters who did come home find Jesus Christ. Amen. Am I loud enough? Sounds pretty good. I'm going to raise this up. <clears throat> don't worry, I'll get louder. <clears throat> like, what? No, you don't, Mike, what? All right, now that that, whoa. <laughs> Rock on! Yeah. All right, now that that's been said, we're going to go ahead and uh, hop into our class. Good soldier of Jesus Christ for the enemy. So thus far in our illustrious tour of the good soldier of Jesus Christ theme, we've covered down on a uh, roxious class on how Jesus Christ, how the Lord God views us as individuals and how separate and different it is from how we actually view ourselves. And so we have two standards. Is do we have our standard, that what we believe, this is what we hold to by the data that we have, or do we have the actual truth that comes from God because he cannot be changed, he cannot be filtered, he cannot be uh, double-minded? Which standard do we go by? And we've discovered, obviously, that we go by the standard that God holds, that we are, in fact, child of God. We are a champion, as I put it. We are a direct representative of God. We've given ourselves completely to God. Therefore, we have the right to claim ourselves as a champion, not through any merit that we might have, but through the merit that God gives us as being a fully submitted child of God. Okay. Then in the second one, we talked about how God views our church, our gathering of champions. God does not want a flock of eagles or a wolf pack of one and a bunch of other ridiculous idioms. God wants a unified, called-out body of believers who are completely submitted to the mission at hand. Every time we look at the host, whether it's the heavenly host, the host of Israelites, um, even the ecclesia, right, it has a connotation of an organized military unit. And therefore, I put in the connotation uh, throughout this, this the, the theme, right, goes along with my military background. 
And so we need to view ourselves as a military unit. We have a specific organization. We have a specific commander. We have a specific set of sub-commanders. And every individual in this body of believers has a job. Right? We have a specific job. Right? You might, some people might refer to it as spiritual gifts. Right? Or a gifting or a calling. Right? And we use that job not just to go out willy-nilly serve God like a vigilante would just throw on a pair of weird outfit and have a stupid haircut and a rifle and be like, I'm a Marine. Mm. Right? We like to call those people crazy. So we go out as a unit towards a specific goal, which is where we get our third class that we covered down, is that specific goal. How do we go forth into the world, that was our third class, as a military unit? Well, we do so not just in battle buddy teams, we do so as a fire team, as a group of people. One man or one woman doesn't go out and fight a war. Just like a pair of men and women don't ever go out and, and get into contact by design. Can they? They do. And have they? They absolutely did, but those are exceptions. It's not the design to the, to the idea of the organization. We send out units of people, fire teams or squads, to go deal with problems. So we look at that, and we also saw that last class of what kind of unit are we? There's different kinds of units, right? This is not the only bride of Christ. When Jesus Christ comes in glory, which he will, hallelujah, Apple Valley Baptist Church isn't the only people raptured, right? And he doesn't have a bunch of brides of Christ. He's not like Solomon, right, who has 300 brides and 700 concubines, where you've got all these different brides of Christ. He has one bride of Christ, okay? But that's not to say we have a universal church. Just like the United States has a military, but they've got Army, Navy, Air Force. And within that, say, let's say the Army, we've got artillery, we've got medicine, we've got admin, we've got JAG, we've got infantry, we have airborne infantry, right? We have special operations, so on and so forth, right? That's also very similar to our churches. We have some churches that are designed to be solely missionary churches. We have churches that are designed to be um, teaching churches where they have schools and have colleges set up, right? And each church is designed by the Holy Spirit and called out by the Holy Spirit for a specific purpose. So now we come to the final, fourth and final class in this series where we found out who we are in the eyes of God. We found out who our church is in the eyes of God. We found out how God wants to organize and why he wants to organize our church, which is to go forth and engage the enemy, now we need to know who the enemy is. Now we need to know who the enemy is. So, Lord, I just ask that you would descend upon us here, Lord, that we would, you are present, Lord, but I had asked that we would open our hearts to you, that we would open our hearts to your prompting, to your word, to your revelation and your inspiration, God, that you would remove me, my personality, um, any sort of biases that I have from this, that you would just present yourself through me, Lord God, to give us all the message that we have prepared for us by the Holy Spirit today. Uh, bless this class, bless our minds and our hearts in this gathering. We ask all these things in your holy name. Amen. Okay. Who is the enemy? Remember, it's interactive. I know it's been a couple weeks. Interactive. Who's the enemy? Satan. Satan is the enemy. Satan is the enemy. And we sometimes forget that. Satan is the enemy. It is not the heroin addict under the bridge. It is not the homosexual in a bedazzled um, bikini bottom with a weird flag. These are all hostages to sin, right? And, and I understand that it's a bit touchy and that elicited a horrible image, but it's supposed to. It's supposed to elicit a negative response. That person is not evil. That person's activities are a sin. Satan has taken these people and he has twisted their minds into a certain lifestyle. But Christ Jesus can save them. Just like a group of rangers or a group of marines can hit the beachhead, right? And they can liberate a town and then drive an enemy force out of that town. And those individuals could then become part of an organization, a unity of people that are dedicated to the same purpose. God can do that to a sinner. Hallelujah, I happen to be a standing living example. Amen. As I'm sure every single saved person in this church is. So let's get to know our enemy. Let's not focus on the people. Let's start focusing on the enemy. Who is Satan and how does Satan work? First off, Satan, his first reference, the first reference to Satan, not first mention, the first reference of Satan is in Genesis 3, and he's referred to as the serpent. The serpent. Um, his first mention, actual, the actual first mention of Satan 
All right, that if I remember correctly, let's see, what, what form did it take in my notes? I want to say it was uh, We Hat Satan or We Has Satan? We Has Satan, which means the enemy in the Hebrew. That was first mentioned in 1 Chronicles 21.1, where the enemy came forth against Israel and David called for a census which he should not have done. It's an interesting study as to why he shouldn't have done a census. And then the oldest mention of Satan, which if I remember correctly, and all of that, was Has Satan, was in Job. Throughout the entirety of the book of Job is the oldest mention, because as we know that most scholars hold that the book of Job predates um, the book of Moses, that we refer to as Genesis. So Satan's been around for a hot second. Satan also has, the name, has different monikers, right? We refer to him as a bunch of different ways, Satan, the devil, uh, so on and so forth. Um, there is one mention that gives an actual name, Lucifer. Lucifer means the shining one or the morning star. And that reference is in Ezekiel 28, 14 through 19, I believe. Let me double check. Is it, thank you, it's Isaiah. Lucifer is Isaiah 14, 12. Uh, Ezekiel 28, 14 through 19 gives an example of what possibly could have been Lucifer's job before the fall. Does anybody know what Lucifer did, possibly, before the fall, before he, he fell? That's right. He led heavenly worship. He led heavenly worship. And as we know the spirit and we know the personality of our God, that, is the, that would be like you would think the highest station in heaven under God would be the, per, the, the angel that led heavenly worship. And then, of course, he had his fall. And what was the point of that fall? What, what brought about that fall? If we look at Ezekiel 28, 14 through 19, it talks about it. Let's get there, Mike. Come on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ezekiel 30, Ezekiel 28, 14. Ezekiel 14 through 19. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz. And the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of, of thy tebrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou hast, wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So we see that what cast him out was the iniquity that was generated by his merchandise. Okay? Now that merchandise in the Hebrew is, is merchandise, but it's also greed, and it's also... Uh, lust for power in things, right, and for a higher position. So Satan, and it's arguable why that came into his, into his, into his, you know, personality, right? But Satan, inarguably, we know, chose other than God, right? And because of that, and he had the highest level of that, the highest shift away from God. Because he did that, he was cast out of heaven. So that's Satan. That was his job before he fell. His job afterwards is to be a pain in the foot. So how does Satan work? This is an interesting thing. I actually was studying into this, and, and uh, man, I tell you what, it was a, it was a, it was a hard run. Um, I sat down with a lot of godly people and sought counsel, and it was like, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, until eventually um, we're at here, so hopefully I'm right. How does Satan work? Well, and I want everybody to take this with a grain of salt when I say this. Satan does not have power. And everybody's like, whoa, hear me out. I'm talking about power, like God's power. Satan does not have God's power. Satan has no control over your soul, right? Matthew 10, 28, we look at Matthew 10, 28. My computer didn't want me to have a word, so I couldn't print. I didn't have time to actually write it all, so I have to look these up. In Matthew 10, 28, it says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That is God. That is not Satan. We fear Satan, right? 
but I think we fear him for the wrong reasons. Satan can elicit harms and troubles in our life, right? As we know in the book of Job, he struck Job with boils. Satan struck Job with boils. He also had, well, arguably called down lightning to fire and, and destroy Job's herds. Okay, now the reason I say arguably is because that lightning is referred to as the, the fire of God, right? And then a great wind was summoned to knock down his house, kill all Job's kids, right? And then Chaldean bandits were called out of the desert, and they came and they, they wiped out his camels and all the rest of that stuff. Satan didn't have the power to create any of that, okay? Satan didn't have the power to create any of that. All of that was given to him by God for a specific task to try Job. So it's not like Satan could just walk up and be like, okay, Drew, you're done. Can't do it. Can't do it. God has to be like, all right, Satan, I'll give you this power to try Drew so that he would glorify me. Does that make sense? He can wreak havoc. He can cause natural disaster, but never without God's permission. Satan and demons can possess people. And then those people who are possessed can cause damage. They can cause damage to the people that are being possessed, or they can cause damage to those around them. There's several, 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 several instances throughout the Bible where possessed people either hurt themselves or hurt others. Okay? Now, however, these are unsaved people. No human being who is saved by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ can be possessed by God. Now, I've heard some arguments about that. Well, what about Judas? Well, Judas wasn't saved. How do you know Judas wasn't saved? Well, it's easy, because after he sinned, where did he turn to? Did he turn to Christ, or did he turn to the noose? Peter denied Christ three times, but returned to Christ. We knew where his heart was. He was saved. Judas did not. Well, what about the woman who was possessed? Well, she was a Jewish woman. Doesn't mean she was saved. Just means she was part of the Hebrew nation. And she went to the temple. Sure, doesn't mean she's saved. People go to church all the time and are not saved. Okay? And there's several, and there's only three instances where people would be like, oh, they, were they saved? Right? But they were possessed, but they weren't saved. It was after their possession that they became saved. Now, um, Satan's primary tool. So this is what Satan's power is. Satan actually has the power of death, the Bible says. Satan has the power of death. And we know that death is the wages of sin. So when you follow that out, it's a whole different study. I don't want to focus too much on Satan, because you know what? Satan's not the point of this class. Fighting Satan is. You want to know about Satan? Do your study on Satan. But Satan's only power is the power of death. And the, the wages of sin is death, so Satan's power is sin. So how does Satan get us to sin? Satan does so. One of his greatest tools, especially in this day and age, is escapism. Is escapism. Now, right now, the biggest form of escapism people see are electronics. What's amazing is this whole last couple weeks, all the rest of these like massive rock star pastors came in and did all my groundwork for me. It's awesome. Um, when Pastor Dunlop, maybe it was Pastor Dunlop, was talking about the self-control. Right, how we, we need to avoid, like, a, for a 14-year-old or a 12-year-old, a, a smartphone is like a kilo of cocaine, right? That's very true. Why? Because that phone offers escapism. One of the greatest forms of escapism is, like, video games, right? Why do we play video games? Well, because that guy's a big, strong guy, and I want to be a big, strong guy, and I'm not. Because that, that guy right there gets to go kill bad guys, and I want to kill bad guys, but I can't. So I'm going to play this video game to be this guy who kills bad guys. Or I get to be a girl out killing bad guys, right? Whatever it is, it allows us to escape our reality. Why do we drink? Some people drink because they enjoy the flavor. They'll have a glass of scotch and it's fine and they can, you know, oh, mm, oh, mm, you know what I mean? But the vast majority of us, I have a couple witnesses out there in the world, drink because I can't sleep, because I'm depressed, because I hear voices in my head telling me that I'm a horrible, horrible human being. You've killed kids. You've killed women and children, Mike. And you did so, so flippantly, that it's unforgivable. So I drink. You've done this, you've done that, this sin, that sin. So I drink to escape that reality. Why do I stick a needle in my arm? Because life's hard, and I just don't want to deal with it, and I just want to escape for a second. Why do I go to pornography? To escape my relationship or the lack thereof that I have to find solace in lust, right? Same thing with adultery. Any of those things, anything. Why do I go to church to escape who I am? I'm going to become a better person 
to Jesus Christ. I'm going to take Jesus like a Xanax. And he's going to make me a better person. A new Mike. So I'm going to escape old Mike. That's why I come to church. Okay, That's all Satan. Satan is a peddler of escapism. Right? Adam and Eve sit in the Garden of Eden, and Eve is like, man, look at this cool tree. I don't like what's going on now. And Satan goes, oh, well, you can escape now. If you eat from the knowledge, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then you'll become like God, and you can escape your reality. What's funny is there was a, what's, the true escape was sitting right next to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was the tree of life. That's the true escape hatch, right? So what's funny is Satan deals in escapism. Satan is also a liar. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 talks about how Satan is a liar. If I can get there. Let's see if anybody can beat me. Probably can. Satan is a liar. Um, but if our gospel, these three, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, it's one of Satan's names, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan is a liar. He'll take truths and he'll twist them. He'll twist them. He'll take all these truths and he'll twist them. He hides, alters, dissembles, and offers alternatives to his truth that people grasp a hold of because it's escapism. If I go into the reality of God, then I get to see who I am for real. Sinners don't come into the light because they fear it because it reveals who they are. So they hide in the darkness, right? They hide, they dissemble. And they come up with all 35,000 different denominations of Christianity, Buddhism, Muslim, Islam, right? All the rest of these different religions. Why? Because if I work at pretending to be somebody else, I get to escape two major realities. The first major reality is I am who I am, which is a sinner. Going to go to the lake of fire, which is not a place where Satan rules. It is a place that he will one day burn for all eternity as punishment. And two, the reality that there is a God. And he is a just God, and he holds me to a certain set of standards. So Satan offers you an escape route. It's easy. Just stick a needle in your arm. Put a bottle to your lips. Hop online. Play 17 hours a day of video games instead of getting into your Bible. Hop on YouTube and watch people camping instead of actually going camping yourself. Eh, guilty. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Don't forget, I'm not bulletproof. So that's Satan, and that's, that's all I'm going to talk about Satan. Because he's not worth my time. He's the enemy. We already know everything we need to know about Satan. He's not God. Period. End of story. In every other form, like remember I keep using these illustrations of World War II, Afghanistan, Iraq. I keep using the illustrations of earthly uh, enemies and earthly fights. And those earthly enemies and those earthly fights, it's good to know your enemy. One, because they're human beings. And they, just because they're your enemy doesn't mean that they're not human beings. Okay? But when it comes to Satan, it's easy. He's not God. Done. That's all I need to know. So we're going to move past that. We're going to move to how to fight Satan as a unit. Pastor Dunlop, Pastor Mills has already talked about how to fight Satan as an individual. What they did over the last two weeks was beautiful. It was wonderful. They're like, here's an M16. The maximum effective range of M16 on a point target is 300 meters. The maximum effective range of an area target with an M16 is 500 meters. The M16 weight, you know, they gave you the tools and how to use them to fight individually. And that was awesome. It was great. It did a lot of groundwork for me. But now we're going to talk about a unit. We got to fight as a unit. We got to fight as a unit. You send one Marine out into the world, or one Ranger, or one, even one Green Beret, one Delta Force guy, he ain't going to do it for long. We got to fight as a unit. So, this is how we fight Satan as a unit. There are three ways to fight as a unit. Get ready to start writing this down. The first way is 80% of the fight. 80% of the fight in any major land engagement is to win the hearts and minds of the individuals in the area of operation. Perfect example of this. I mean, hold on. I don't want to get ahead of myself. We must combat the damage Satan has done to the populace as well as fighting Satan himself. Not attacking the people or their ideals necessarily, but by loving lost people and fostering trust for us that will lead them to God. If you've ever had to try to have a conversation with a person who does not know God personally, you cannot tell them about God. Why? 
Anybody have any idea why you can't tell a lost person about God? Tyler, why can't you tell an atheist about God? Everybody's my, was one of my besties, Tyler. Why can't you tell an atheist about God? Because he doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe in God. Right? He does not believe in God. I cannot use the Bible as a reference to an atheist because he doesn't believe in the Bible. So what you got to do is you have to offer that person a, a harbor of trust. We can't just go up and, you're going to hell unless you take this track and read it and learn God and Jesus Christ and then you're done. Bye. Talk to you later. Next house. You're going to go burn in hell because you're a sinner. Take this track, teach you how to not to do it. You know, that doesn't foster any trust. We have to win the hearts and minds of the people we're in. Right? Right out there. Because once they realize what love is, and that's God's love through us to them, then they go, oh, there's something different. There's something new. There's something unusual about this person. I don't know what this is. And then they can trust me that God is real. And then once they trust that God is real, then they can trust that God is real. And that's the start of that true relationship. So we've got to win hearts and minds, right? If all we're doing is you're going to burn in hell, why would anybody want to come to that? And that's also not a good depiction of our God. So this is 80% of the fight. The enemy cannot control or hold ground where he is not welcome, right? Um, an example of that, a perfect example, is, the, is Afghanistan. So back in, way back in, way back land, when half the church wasn't even born, uh, there was a young private by the name of Mike Piscopo who had a stupid haircut and wore an even stupider outfit, joined the army, and he's hanging out one day, and some crazy person ran a bunch of planes into a tower. And then a couple days after that, we found out it was Afghanistan, and we started shipping guys over to Afghanistan. Now, who were we fighting? Were we fighting Afghanistan, or were we fighting Al-Qaeda? We're fighting Al-Qaeda. We were liberating Afghanistan. A lot of people, especially young people, don't realize that. When we invaded Iraq, we weren't fighting the Iraqis. We were liberating Iraq from the regime of Saddam Hussein, right? We weren't attacking Europe. We were liberating Europe from the Nazi Third Reich, the Nazi regime, okay? So who controls the Wenatchee Valley? Satan, right? He's the lowercase g god of this world. So instead of attacking them, we have to liberate them from the regime of, of Satan. So we get to Afghanistan, and this is going to so ring true. They've been lied to by the powers that be. And when we got there, we had found true believers. We had found true believers in the form of the Mujahideen. We treated them better and showed them the better way through our actions. We convinced them that we weren't the same as the last people who looked exactly like us and spoke similar to us. That was the Russians. White people with guns, right? Who are like, your political system's not right. You need to do ours. And we're going to force you to do it. Oh, you don't want to force us to do it? Well, then we're going to condemn you and try to wipe you out and instill our own in this area. Okay? Because we weren't the Russians, we didn't deal with them that way. We showed them a correct way of doing things and a correct way of thinking things. We won these true believers over. Right? And these true believers joined us in the fight. They wanted liberty for their country. They didn't want to become America. They wanted to become free Afghanistan. And they joined us in this fight. And we worked together. We trained them and we brought them up. And we went forth into Afghanistan to fight the true enemy, which was Al-Qaeda. And what's crazy is a lot of the members of Al-Qaeda left Al-Qaeda and joined Afghanistan. The Afghan, free Afghan people, because the Taliban was a political party of Afghanistan that was in control. And it was, the, again, it was always the minority of evil controlling the majority of the neutral until a small, small minority of the good rises up to sway the neutral against the evil. Tracking? But, 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 what happened? Conventional forces and a corrupt government came in and led them astray. They took the idea of this liberty and led them astray, and to, much to my shame, as a member of those armed forces, and as a patriot of this horribly corrupt government, they were led astray by a doctrinal living instead of a true living of democracy. And things are just as bad, if not worse. This year, all US forces are going to pull out of Afghanistan, all of them. You're like, you already did. No, not really. There's some other guys there. All of it's gone. Afghanistan has to stand on its own. You know what's going to happen? It's going to be worse than it was. It's going to be worse than it was. And here's why. This is the whole point. 
This is the whole point of winning the hearts and minds. You can't just say, oh, you're, you're gonna, you're, you guys are good. You got it figured out. Apple Valley Baptist has it figured out. Look at the fellowship. Look at how you could generate $11,000 in a single weekend with like 75% of your population. You got it figured out, man. Right? Yeah, I want in. What happens when Apple Valley Baptist leaves? People fall flat on their face. Right? Same thing with Afghanistan. And here's why. Because the United States government did not impart to them the power that liberated them. Does that make sense? Why? Why was the United States of America able to liberate Afghanistan? It wasn't our power, our raw fighting power. The Russians showed up with way bigger forces, spent way more money. They put themselves, Afghanistan is a direct link to the fall of the Soviet Union's bankruptcy because they poured so much money into Afghanistan that it almost bankrupted them. And so they ended up having to pull out. Right? What happened to Afghanistan? Got worse. It used to actually be like a tropical paradise. Not tropical, but it was beautiful. It's a tourist attraction for all of like the Middle East. It's gorgeous. Back in like the 50s. And then the Americans came in. So did the Americans bring more might? We like the raw bang on our chest. I'm like, Argh. You ever want to take a look at who's, who's got more might? Take a look at the new recruiting videos. <laughs> Between the Chinese, the Russians, and the Americans, you're going to be ashamed of our country. Anyways, moving on. What liberated Afghanistan wasn't a bunch of six-foot-tall paratroopers, minus me. <laughs> right? It wasn't a bunch of F-16s and A-10, two Thunderbolts, and, which we're going to get to. It wasn't the power of America that liberated them. Okay? It was the ideal of democracy, that we treated them differently. That you're not, you know, you're not just the Taliban. There's a new way, there's a better way, and they're like, I like it. We're gonna take the form of democracy, the form of goodness. We're gonna, now we're gonna shift over to the spiritual world, the form of godliness. And then what happens is we left, and we're leaving currently, and then what's gonna happen? That form has no power, has no power to sustain itself. So it's going to get worse than it was. And that's what happens when we, as a church, as we as a church body, we go forward and we proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And we show up and what we do is we teach them a form. It, like we have the power of Christ, and we teach, but we don't impart that power to them. So that when the power of Christ leaves that house, right? When Pastor Corey and Sister Wendy leave that house after the Bible study, they don't have that power indwelling in them because they haven't accepted Jesus Christ yet, and it falls. So part of the deal of winning the hearts and minds is imparting the power to them that liberated them. Right? Does that make sense? Up, down, left, right? Okay. You have to impart the, the power which liberated them when you're winning hearts and minds. You can't just show them away and expect them to follow a, a lifestyle. So how do we impart that power? So we love them. We love these people. you got to show up and you don't just hand a track. Right? You walk up and you're like, man, their lawn's on nut mode. Wow, you're, you're an older lady. Would you like me to mow your lawn? Or wouldn't it be neat if she just walked outside and found some weird kid mowing her lawn? What are you doing? Mowing your lawn. Why? Because you did your lawn mode. I could have done it. I'm sure you could, but I love you. And I wanted to do it. I don't even know you. doesn't matter. I love you anyways. Where'd you get this love? Well, I know this love, and I can pro provide this love because I know the love of Jesus Christ. Do you know the love of Jesus Christ? Oh, I don't. Tell me all about this love. Think it's my lawn mode? Sure. And then guess what happens? Is the fishes and loaves of her lawn leads to the fact that she realizes there is a God, and he does love me, and she accepts that power within him so that when that young man leaves her house, she has that power indwelling in her. See what I mean? And now it's hard ground for Satan, not easy ground. One of the reasons, why remember we studied Normandy? Remember we studied D-Day? Okay? One of the reasons why we had such a successful assault onto that enemy ground was because the locals hated the Nazis. Why did they hate the Nazis? Remember we talked about that? Because for months beforehand, the OSS and the French underground were out spreading the word. It's not going to be like this forever. There's hope. There's a new way coming. There's a better way. Here's some food. I know you're starving. Yeah, but you're starving too, but it's okay, because now we get a little bit together. Right? And they loved the community. And then what happened? Man, I, I, yeah, I don't like the Nazis, but life is easier. And I'm making money off the Nazis, but I like this way better because there's hope. 
And when the Nazis leave because they're going to leave, I've got a better way of life, and I get to live this better way of life. So I'm going to join you, right? Same thing here. So when we go over into East Wenatchee, we go into Wenatchee, we go into these different neighborhoods, we get to love these people, right? Love thy neighbor. Love thine enemy. It's easy. If you, if you love your brother, there's no credit to you there, right? That's easy. Love your enemy. And that's how we win them to Jesus Christ. So how do we fight Satan? Step number one, hearts and minds. We've got to win hearts and minds. Step number two. Step number two, and this is one's always everybody's favorite, direct assault. Direct assault. This isn't necessarily exercising demons, by the way. Everybody gets all fired up. We're going to go and we're going to exercise demons and we're going to do all the rest of this stuff. Okay? And people like to say, we're going to go fight Satan. No, you're not. You have no business fighting Satan. You could fight his demons. But you're not fighting Satan. There's only one fight you're going to win. There's only one fight where Satan's going to be defeated. I read about it in the back of that book. Jesus Christ has the fight that defeats Satan. He will come and defeat Satan. We get to combat his minions. But one of the greatest ways we're going to combat him directly is by attacking strongholds. That's how we, as a unit, fight Satan directly. We don't come and, and, and grab Dude Meyer and throw him down and be like, you're going to burn in hell because you're a sinner. One, that's not biblically true. The only reason people burn in hell is because they don't have Jesus Christ. We're all sinners, right? God hates you because you're a sexual lifestyle. No, he doesn't. He hates the sexual lifestyle. He doesn't hate that person, right? So how do we do it? We, we assault strongholds. Just like in Afghanistan. I couldn't walk up and be like, hey, that guy's got a black turban on, which was, that was the mark of, 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 of Al-Qaeda. And the Taliban specifically, was they would wear a specific type of black turban or shama. And you would know, ooh, man, that guy's Taliban. And they, they, get, they see you, they like, gather together, and, and they look at you, <laughs> right? Pew, pew, and I can shoot that guy, right? I couldn't, right? Because there's a reason they put down certain laws because that's not how you win a war. Why don't you just randomly shoot every guy with a black turban on his head? You don't win the war. There's a, like a movie that none of you should ever watch because it's not a godly movie. But anyways, it's, I'm going to quote it anyways. It's slaughter them till you rot, you will do nothing. 13th Warrior, if you ever want to know what it's like to be a warrior, just make sure you have it filtered. It's actually not that bad. I don't think there's any bad language. It's just violent. It's talking about being a warrior. Right? And that's referencing to you can go kill, you can go attack the minions, you can attack the people who are caught up. But until you take down the stronghold, you'll have no victory. You have no victory until you take down the stronghold. Anybody ever here read the book of Joshua? A lot of hands should be going up. It's interactive, guys. Or we're starting all over again, week one. All right, who am I? No, I'm joking. A lot of people are like, oh God, no, just get them off the pulpit already. All right, remember, this is long-suffering. It's not patience. It's a different word. All right, in the book of Joshua, you ever wonder why they were attacking cities and not people? You ever notice that? In the book of Joshua, what's the first place they show up? The Jerichoans? Jerichites? Jerkyites? I don't know. No, they went to the stronghold. And what was the victory? Was it when the, the Hebrews rushed in and slaughtered everybody but Rahab? Or was it the falling of the walls around the stronghold? That was the victory. The stronghold was the victory, not the slaughter of the people. We're going we're to get to that in this one. So, strongholds. That's how we, as Christians, as a unit, directly attack Satan. So what are examples of strongholds? You're going to go back and be like, yeah, but brother, John, Mike, in the book of Joshua, talking about kings and the number of soldiers that each city brought to bear. Yeah, all that was, talking about stronghold and the king in charge of that stronghold. That's the demon that's in charge of that stronghold. Okay, and then, which is an interesting study, especially since we're getting into Melchizedek. Yeah, Adonai Zedek. Adonai Zedek, if you want to say it like people say Melchizedek instead of Malki Zedek. Anyways, interesting study. And then they give you a number of people that were in that city to fight to just show you the strength. That's all it was. But none of those people were named. Now, in the Israel, in the, the host of the Hebrews, it talks about people. Right? Was it three score and six died today, I? Two score and six, something like that? Right? It talks about this guy, that guy, that one guy. Right? Because for us, the people matter. Right? But the strongholds is the point when it comes to the enemy. So what are examples? Adult stores. We're just going to leave it there. 
gentlemen's clubs, which are neither gentlemanly nor clubby. Planned Parenthood offices. The modern day worship of Baal, infanticide. Okay, well at least the worshipers of Baal back then at least had the common courtesy to give birth to the baby first before they murdered it in the womb. Civil office corruption. Mayors who are corrupt, sheriffs who are corrupt, health department officials who are corrupt. Corruption in our government. Bars and nightclubs. Places that foster societies and cultures of sin. Drug dens, public school evolution curriculum, etc., etc. These are strongholds that we must attack. Not argue again. Like, ah, that's why I homeschool my kids. As I walk away, All right? Imagine if a paratrooper from the imagine if rerun in Afghanistan was like, yeah, that's why that's why I vote Republican in America instead of going and fighting a stronghold. What would have happened? Jail. What would we back home would have called him? Coward. That's a hard word to hear. Which brings us to some meat. So if that's how we attack, in strongholds, and every single person like, no, it makes sense. So why don't we? Why don't we attack these strongholds? Even if it was individuals, we see a, a sinful man or a sinful woman, why don't we go rescue the hostage? I'll tell you why, the cost. This was touched on just recently, it's incredible. I was like literally writing it down, I was like, oh, he's talking about the cost. Yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna say. Okay, cool, all right. Why is it so hard to attack these strongholds? The cost, the cost of time, the cost of money, the cost of landing, or lives, and, and social standing, doubt. This is why we don't make these assaults. We doubt ourselves. Here's a beautiful example, and I hope I don't get some people worked up, to include myself. Ayub KL, Afghanistan, 2002. There were bad guys in a stronghold in a village outside of coast Afghanistan. Members of 5th Special Forces Group, some other individuals that we're not going to name because we're live streaming. And Third Platoon, Bravo Company, 1st, the 505th Parachute, Parachute Infantry Regiment, deployed out of our FOB, which is, again, remember, that's the church. This is the place where we exist, where we train, where we refit, where we eat, we sleep. We gathered together. We left there and went directly over to here because there was actionable intel, and higher command said, go, go find these bad guys and go, go put a foot to their door. And we did. And we did. And that was a hard day. That was a hard day. It was quite a cost that day, because guess what we found? We found the enemy in that stronghold. And there was an immediate cost of self. As we pulled up, there was an immediate cost of, here we go. Am I going to make it out the other end of this? There was an immediate cost. There was a monetary cost to this firefight. I actually sat down and did a rough calculation of the actual monetary U.S. dollar cost of this 10-hour engagement. For five, five, right? Five, seven. How many guys were there, Mike? I can't remember. Five, seven? I think it was seven. Yeah, seven and then the kid. The cost of this one 10-hour battle, I wouldn't even call it a firefight because a firefight, by definition, is short. This was 10 hours. Was one trillion... Three hundred and seventy-three billion, eight hundred and six of your dollars. When you calculate what it took to put that number of paratroopers in the field, thirty thousand dollars a shot. What it took to put the A-10 pilots into the field, roughly two million dollars a shot. What it took to put the Apache pilots into the field. What it took to get the Apaches there, the A-10s there. The 56 A-10 gun runs at $1,000 per round coming out of that firearm at, what, 6,000 rounds a minute? Each A-10 gun run that lasts, 50, I can't remember 6,000, but each A-10 gun run that lasts 15 seconds is 4,000 rounds at $1,000 a piece. 
the body armor, the rifles, the bullets, the grenades, the 500 pound bombs, which was for me was weird because that was the cheapest part. They're only like 2,500 bucks a shot. One trillion dollars and change. When billions are changed, that's a staggering amount of money. And right now we're like, oh, that's a vast sum of money. But I tell you what, when they started attacking us and I saw Mike go down and I saw Brian go down and I saw Chris go down, I wasn't going, man, each one of these bullets costs 25 cents a round. I better not waste these, right? It's gonna cost how many millions to get that A-10 gun in? To drop a, what? Uh, you guys just go back. Just don't charge us, go back. It's not worth it. Not one person there counted the cost in the fight. Not one. Because we're in the fight. It was worth four times that amount. What about the cost and lives of that fight? There were five enemy KIA that day. One Taliban person walked out of that firefight. And that's only because myself and a couple other guys gave blood to keep him alive. He was a 14-year-old who was the youngest bomb builder, the son of, the, young, of the, the greatest bomb builder in the Al-Qaeda network. He was the youngest son. We kept him alive. There was one KIA, Sergeant First Class Chris Spears. There were three wounded in action, Mike being one of them. There were six friendly KIA, three interpreters and three guards, Afghan guards. Not to mention several cattle, goats, pigs, 500 pound bombs have an effect on the landscape. Crops. There was a massive cost to the area. We destroyed 10 acres of farmland in that firefight. Like destroyed, burnt, you've heard the term burnt earth or scorched earth. Man, 10 hours of fighting will do it. There was a cost. There was a cost to the crops that were destroyed. There was a cost to the village that was right there. Those people were bitter at us. They were so bitter. We ended jobs that day. They knew those people. They might not have liked them, but they knew them. They treated them well. They paid them well for the use of that compound. And then when you Americans came in, look what you did. You destroyed the way I make money. My kids who did nothing to you, who are not a problem to you, or your weird ideology, are going to go hungry. Because I don't have the ability to milk my goat, eat that cow, harvest that grain and that corn. There was a collateral damage to assaulting the enemy. There always is. That's how he works. He gets it worked in our mind of like, I don't want to go over there and assault that stronghold. Look at the cost. They're going to laugh at me. That person's going to lose his job if we shut that gentleman's club down. He can't be a DJ anymore going, ah, you know, eh, eh. it's always the same DJ. That's weird. None of you should be laughing. You shouldn't know. That was a joke. There's always a cost. Is it worth it? We go right now to the wife and children, the three children of Sergeant First Class Chris Spears. And I would say, if I had a magical God, God wand, and I could wave it and bring your husband back, Chris, back to you, would you do it? She's like, yes, right now, bring him back. And I said, but if I did so, all five of those terrorists would be back on the earth. That compound would be fixed. They would live inside that compound. That youngest son that we captured would still be there. And because we didn't get the intel from him about his brothers and his fathers, the five or the four best bomb builders for Al-Qaeda would never have been caught and they would still be wreaking havoc all over the world blowing things up. Would you take that deal? And she'd say, never. My husband would die 50 times, 100 times over to keep that from happening. The cost. We never count the cost when you're in the fight. And only the worst of people go back and look back and count the cost. If it's a good thing. One of the things that Mike and I and a lot of veterans struggle with is we look back on what we did. We ask, was it worth 
what we did. I find it is not at all an accident that today is Memorial Day. The cost of those men and women who gave their lives, was it worth it when we look at this country? Aborting babies, openly propagating pornography and addiction, What was the cost that we paid for what we have now? What did it buy? Was the cost worth it? The cost of lives, the cost of time, the cost of money, was it worth it? Would Adoniah Judson ever say, was it worth it? Matt Stallman, was it worth the $7,000 to go to Comoros? Michael Rewakowski, was it worth it? Live having a life of pain? Yeah. Yes, it was. Absolutely worth it. And every day I wake up in pain, physical, emotional, spiritual, and it was worth it. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Because what my body bought that day, I saw the fruit of. So did Mike. Buying a Christmas tree in Rainier, Washington, a Muslim family had converted, had come to America, converted to Christianity, and were buying their very first Christmas tree. And they were Pashtun, which was that area that Mike and I fought so hard in. Is it worth the cost to us? Point three. This is one of the hardest ones. Winning hearts and minds, that's an easy thing we've got worked in our mind. That's missions, and we're going to go out and win hearts and minds, and we're going to go to Fiji, and we're going to go to Africa, Zambia. We're going to feed these people, and we're going to drill wells and schoolhouses, and we're going to teach them about Jesus Christ. We get fired up about that. And we're going to go attack strongholds. We're going to picket Planned Parenthood the right way. We're not going to be screaming at them, telling them that they're going to burn. We're going to try to love them and just try to convince people, don't murder your baby. We'll pay for it. Our church will pay for your baby. We're going to do it all the right way. We get fired up about that. We get really excited about that. But there's a third way you come in direct contact with the enemy. And that's reaction to contact. React to contact. This is the hardest way. What about when the enemy comes to you? The inspiration for this class came through the Holy Spirit in this, this exact form. This day, I'm sitting here and I'm like, God, you keep having these great men, these great preachers who are so much more eloquent, educated, and the word come before me, and they're, they're just stealing my class. And as soon as I get a rough draft, the next guy comes in and steals my class, right? And he's, obviously, they're building groundwork, not stealing what's not mine. But they're building this groundwork. And I was like, what do I got left? And the Holy Spirit said, here, I want you to talk about Ariana. I want you to talk about Ariana. And I was like, why? Why would I? Why? Whoa, yeah, Ariana. I'm like, who's Ariana? Ariana's not a who, it's a where. The following content will be offered in a secure manner. Names and uh, times and locations will be altered to protect all things overseas. The Ariana is a place that's called the Ariana Hotel that is now a forward operating base of the State Department, where the State Department's mission there is the demilitarization of the country of Afghanistan. Everybody tracking? Everybody's heard the canned announcements enough, I would say. Do you understand? I hope that you get an idea of what I'm talking about. I used to work there as a security operative. And on July 27, 2003, at roughly 9 o'clock in the morning, it appeared to be like any other morning. We were inside our base. This is where we lived. This is where we gathered, where we were fed, where we were trained, where we trained others and where we had fellowship with one another. This was our place. Sounds like a church. And like every other morning, we went about our business, doing what we do every day. And then at about 9 o'clock in the morning, that changed. A Toyota Land Cruiser, white, pulled up to the outer perimeter of security where we had local Afghan guards who were there to check these cars to make sure they had the proper paperwork and placards 
on the windows to allow them to pass. If they had the right sequence of numbers or letters or shapes or vague things that I'm not allowed to offer on open source material, they would be allowed to go by. So a white Toyota Land Cruiser showed up and it provided a placard in the window. And these Afghan guards <clears throat> were lackadaisical. The car looked good, looked right, right? It's a white Land Cruiser, like every other white Land Cruiser. Hundreds of them go through this area every day. Right? You've got the palace across the street, you've got the German embassy there, the French embassy there, you've got ISAF over here, you've got United States Army over there, Marines over there, this organization's over there, that organization's over there, and then right here at the corner is the Ariana for the State Department. We get cars like this all day. So it pulled up and it flashed a placard. And they were like, ah, oh, yeah, it's a white Land Cruiser, it's got a placard, it looks right, there's something wrong with it though. That's all right. It's early in the morning. I have it out of my shin chai, which is the green tea. And the guys in it are white, and they're in digital uniform, right? So they just waved them through. And they came up to our gate, where they encountered our gate guards, our Afghan gate guards, well-trained every week, two, three times a week. They would gather for training. They knew what they were doing. And the car pulled up right where it's supposed to pull up. These cars pull up right where they were supposed to pull up, right? So this car pulls up, and it's right there, and it's like every other buddy else, you know, it's like, hey, this looks the right, this looks right. And they walked up. They walked up without their rifles. They left them in the guard shack. Why? Why would I carry a rifle? I've done this a million times. Nothing bad's ever happened yet. So they were unprepared. And they brought their little mirror that's on a wheel and a stick to look underneath the car. But they'd done it a million times and honestly really didn't know what they were looking for. What they knew was that they ran the mirror and they looked at the mirror by the car. And that's what they knew. That's as far as their training had gone into their head. That's not what the Americans trained them, but that's as far as the, America, the, the, the Afghan guards had accepted as their training. And so they ran the mirror by. And had they been paying attention to what they were trained to do, they would have noticed the 10,000 pounds of high explosives underneath the car. And had they looked into the car and paid more attention through the tinted windows, they would have noticed that the white guys in digital uniform are actually Afghans with whitening cream. Because for some reason, everywhere but America, you know, Americans want to get tan, everywhere else wants to get white. It's the weirdest thing. And they had spent months of putting whitening cream to lighten their skin. And then they put on army stupid gray digital AC uniforms and they had body armor on. But had they looked closer, they would have noticed that the body armor wasn't an American issue, it was Russian. And they would have noticed that the, 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 instead of the Armalite rifle style rifle, the M16 or M4 style rifle, they would have noticed that it was a Kalishnikov style rifle with a lot that was painted black. But you know why they didn't look too close? Because every single time they walk up and it really was a white person in the car, don't you dare look at me that close. Some of this should be ringing pretty true for some of us. How dare you look at me so closely? Get out of my car, get out of my face. I have a placard. Look at me, I'm dressed right. Just let me in. But they didn't, because that's the way they were trained. Just like Pastor Dunlap was talking about, how do we train our children? That's how we had trained our guards. Don't look at me. Get out of my face. And so I'm like, yeah, everything looks great. And they turned around, and they turned their back. And that was when the day started. The doors opened. And six insurgents got out of the car. Within 30 seconds, five of those guards were dead. Ba -ba 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 -ba, and they were dead. These guys came armed for bear. They came trained. They came knowing what they were doing. And they shot and killed those five guards instantly, dead. The remainder of the guards turned in shock and realized, I am unprepared for this. My weapon is in the guard shack. And you could see on the video, because we studied the video afterwards, and you could see them doing this. Which way do I go? Do I attack? Do I stand here? Or do I go get my weapon? But because they were improperly trained, they didn't show up for the fight with violence of action. Remember the first class, violence of action. I will arrive violently. No matter what I do, I'm going to do it with everything I've got. They were frozen in place. And in under a minute and a half, nine guards were dead, lying on the floor. Now what's wild is this, this makes a lot of noise. Gate one, which was right over the side for here, that's the main American gate. That's the main American gate. If you belong to the space, you go in through that gate. Those guys, Americans sitting in that gate, professionals, have to have at least three years of special operations background. You have to be a combat vet. These guys are very professional, okay? Very 
well-trained, were too busy listening to Tosh.0 on their computer, that when the gunfire happened, they were like, was that gunfire? And at that point, they had lost combat initiative. Oh, that's gunfire. Oh, well, I got to take a second to put my laptop down. Oh, oh, almost dropped my hard drive. These happened. I talked to these guys afterwards. They made sure all their stuff was put away. Their distractions were put away first. I'm going to get right with my life first. And then they grabbed the rifles and left. Well, by that point, the enemy, and we're going to get back to what happened between then and now, but the enemy had already taken ground and were using our very defenses against us. So that was going on at gate one. Now we have tower three. Tower three is there specifically to overlook that gate and overlook that intersection. Tower three, man, this is powerful. And that, brother, if you're watching, just know I love you and I do forgive you. But tower three stepped outside of his tower to see what was going on. How interesting is that? And what had happened was these insurgents were trying to get in because they knew exactly where to get us. If I could just get in, I could really cause some damage. But they ran up to the gate, right, and boom. The first guy detonates against the gate. Well, guess what? Guess what? We build a good gate. And in the metaphor of this guard, this guy, this insurgent being Satan, trying to get into the fob, the gate was too strong. Amen? Our God is a mighty gate. They could not breach the walls. They tried. They blew several of themselves up with 75 and 95 pound explosive vests. But all it did was just singe the paint. Because our God is a high tower that we seek refuge in. Amen? So they couldn't destroy the church. They couldn't destroy the church. So guess what they did? I'm going to start picking. I'm going to start shooting at the members. So they turn and they see, oh, there's Apollo. That was his call sign. There's Apollo up in Tower 3. So they start shooting at Apollo. And it was real bullets. And it was withering gunfire. It was real. But this is a bulletproof tower. All right? It's not like it's made out of mesh and, and cardboard. This is a real multi-million dollar tower that stops bullets. But these are real bullets coming at him. These are four. If you've never had real Kalashnikov coming at you, man, I tell you what, it's real. It's real. And so what did he do? To his great shame, he hit the ground. And that's where he stayed. So when he came under withering gunfire, he hit the ground. He didn't return fire, he hit the ground. And he curled up in a fetal position and he bawled. Meanwhile, more guards are dying. And all, literally, all hell is breaking loose. Now what happens next? Well, this is also interesting. There were two, unfortunately, Navy SEALs who were members of a different organization, security organizations. Oh, he's Navy SEALs. Right? And these two Navy SEALs got a great idea. We're going to take it upon ourselves, by ourselves, with one rifle and one magazine apiece, because we're so cool we can do it with just one rifle and one magazine apiece. And we're going to go out the door that's not supposed to be opened. It's supposed to be locked down. But I'm going to force my way out. And on my own, I'm going to take out these insurgents. And they rolled around the corner, shot three bullets. And when the insurgents turned their attention to them, they ran all the way back to the door. Let me in, let me in, let me in, let me in. Now, I'm not saying anything about these guys. They're SEALs. They're my brothers. These guys, I know these guys. They're professionals. I've served them before. And like I said, when six, seven, eight, well, hold on, we lost a couple guys at the, at the door. So when like five or six insurgents turn fully automatic Kalashnikovs on you, that's real. And so meanwhile, where they're trying to bang their way back in the door, because guess what? We're like, no, nope, door's locked. It's supposed to stay locked. They're stuck outside. There's a whole other group of Navy SEALs from a different organization who are like, we're going to throw grenades over the wall at these bad guys. And we don't care where they land. All we care about is that we're throwing grenades at bad guys. We don't care who's hurt in the process. And these other two Navy SEALs and a couple of the Afghan guards who were trying to fight their way, they got their butts kicked a little bit. And they couldn't go and engage the enemy because all these grenades that these guys were just like, ah, I don't care what happens. I'm throwing grenades over the wall. Don't worry. We're going to get back and dissect this if you're not tracking. And then, and then... Glory of glories, Tower 4 gets into action, and he's a really good friend of mine, Titus. I can't say his real name. Titus, beast, beast of a man, realizes there's trouble. Tower 4 is down. I don't know if he's dead or not. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to do what I'm told to do. 
And he puts his little AR down, and he grabs the pig, the 240, off of the mount, fassoons himself with ammunition, puts on his body armor correctly, takes the time to put his helmet on and his glasses, his protective goggles, and he walks out of that tower into open fire and from the hip starts suppressing the enemy. You know what's more impressive than five Kalashnikovs? One M240 Bravo. One M240 Bravo wipes them all out and they started running and from the hip, walking, man, this guy's, I mean, this guy's like, he's, yeah. he's walking like Rambo, laying down hate, just laying it down until he gets to Tower 3. His sole purpose wasn't to kill the bad guys. It was to get to Tower 3 because Apollo was hurt or dead or in trouble. And now it's term he had to turn his back to walk up the unguarded stairs, but he did it. And he got up there. When he came into the room, when he came into the tower, there's Apollo on the floor. His body armor is over there. There's a laptop on the ground because Apollo had been watching inappropriate content instead of doing what he was supposed to be doing. And when the fight started, he didn't have his armor on, he didn't have his helmet on, he didn't have a weapon system in his hand. He just walked out into the parapet and goes, what's going on? Oh, they're firing at me. And he laid down on the ground. He started crying. But guess what, guess what Titus did? Get up, you coward, and kick them. No, brother, I'm here. Let's get up and return fire. And in the after action report, you always got to sit down and talk about what happened. Everybody hated Apollo. Kick him out. He's a coward. The only person who had his back was Titus, because he was there. He was in the fight with him. And how dare any of us try to judge that man when we weren't right there with him. Now, because of Titus, the tide turned. He had suppressed them enough that the guys from gate one who finally got their act together were able to sweep onto the objective and set up a base of fire. And those two Navy SEALs that were banging on the door heard the gun firing stop, and guys threw magazines over the top of the wall to them. They reloaded, and they rolled around the corner, and they dropped the last of the guys. Fight over. Because one man did what he was supposed to do. One man can start a difference, but it takes more than one man to make a difference. One man put on his armor correctly. He put on his whole armor correctly, and he took the appropriate weapon system and engage the enemy without fear of his own life. Not to defeat and destroy and kill those guys, but to suppress them so that he could get to Apollo, who was in desperate need. Because here we're going to go back to the hearts and minds. Apollo was a Marine. Remember, you have to have a certain amount of time in, in theater. You have to have a certain amount of time in special operations. This was not Apollo's first firefight. But guess what? When Apollo was in the Marine Corps, he relied on the power of the Marine Corps and did not have that power in himself. So that when he was by himself, he could not stand on his own. Titus, on the other hand, had that power himself. And so he was able to go help. You see? We have guys throwing grenades over the walls. We don't care what happens to those people out there. We're going to say hateful and evil things. And we're just going to throw this hate out into the world. What, why are you doing this? Well, to defeat the enemy. Yeah, but who's hurt in the process? Is that collateral damage worth it? God hates fags. You're all going to burn in hell. No, that's not worth it. God doesn't hate them. He just hates their lifestyle. Bring them in. Heroin addicts, you burn in hell. How about we bring them in, get them off the drugs so that they can accept Jesus Christ? You're a monster. You killed people. You should burn in hell. Okay, well, maybe somebody should come to you in your room in Afghanistan and offer the gospel to you, and you can accept them on your, on your knees. Instead of throwing hateful stuff out in the world, not caring who it damages. Don't run out into the world like these other two Navy SEALs did, thinking you've got this, like you're some sort of hero, and you're going to go out there by yourself, and you're going to do something by yourself. Great. The church is under attack, and I'm going to go a direct assault by myself. You ain't going to make it, kid. You ain't got enough fight in you. You will not know the fullness of God until you are in the body of Christ. So why would you send two guys when we could send 90? Maybe you're Apollo in Tower 3. Maybe we've come under attack directly. Those attacks are real. Those fiery darts are real. And if they get me, they hurt. They have a real effect on me. 
but because I don't have that power and dwelling in me yet to stand on my own, I can't. I just can't, and I fall to it all the time. So instead of us going and kicking the guy, get up, coward! Get out! Pick the guy up, return fire. When Brother Dunlap said, oh, man, it was wild. Has anybody else done the pray for four other things every time you're tempted? I have. I tell you what, man, it total game changer. I can't believe I didn't think of it first. You know why? Well, because I'm not as spiritual as he is. That it wasn't my message to give. Return fire. Don't hate the guy. Return fire. Get up, man. Come on. We can do this. Pay attention. If you're gate one, pay attention. If you're the guy who's supposed to be doing it, pay attention. Do your job. What's our job? To preach the gospel. Be ready at all times. At all times to engage the enemy. Because we don't know when he's going to show up here and attack. He already has. He already has. How many relationships have so much friction inside this church already? Because the enemy is attacking us. Individually. He can't attack this body. Because he, God, is a mighty tower. And he protects the body. But man, they can sure throw some Kalishnikov at our individual members. So do your job. Don't be like gate one, doing something other than your job. Right? You're ready. You're ready to go. Those guys were sitting in body armor, ready to go, highly trained. But they weren't doing their job. They were just sitting there doing something else. Don't be complacent. Somebody else's job. I'm tired of doing the same thing over and over and over and over again without effect. I'll just look at the mirror. I won't notice the 10,000 pounds of bomb underneath this car. I won't, get in, I won't examine this too closely because I'm tired of getting yelled at. I'm tired of getting mistreated for nothing other than being who I am because I'm not good enough. Don't be complacent. Stay in the fight. And don't be fooled by something that looks the part. It looks the part. Man, it's got white skin, it's got the right uniform on, it's got placards, but it's not right. There's something wrong about it. Don't let it in. Don't let it in. Just because it looks right, it's a form of godliness. Let's go to Luke 14, 28, 32. This is going to be fun because I've got, all I've got is the passage written down. I can't remember what exactly what it says. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm going to admit right now, uh, there's, I'm sure some of you are going to disagree with what I'm about to say. Um, I want you to understand that I'm going to, I'm just throwing it out there, and I'm fully admitting that I could be wrong in its interpretation. However, comma, let's say the word of God. For which of you intending to build a tower, sit not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? That was 28, right? Luke 14, 28? Yep. 29, lest haply, which is not happily, it's haply, which means lest ever. After he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, consulteth whether he was able to, with 10,000, to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an, ambas an embassage and desires conditions of peace. I hear this thrown around a lot. Count the cost. Count the cost. Count the cost. Count the cost. Count the cost before you build your tower. Well, I'm going to submit. I'm just going to submit this. I don't think either one of these are positive. I think these are both condemnations. Because why are they counting the cost? Or else they might begin to mock. Do you count the cost of your service to God? Do you sit there and go, man, what's going to happen if I give everything to God? Don't count the cost. Because if you count the cost, then you're like the king. Who's like, I've got 10,000 guys, and look at them. They're coming with 20,000 guys. Can my 10,000 guys beat his 20,000 guys? Oh, I'm not sure. Let's send an ambassador to sue for peace. That's not at all biblical. We're not supposed to sue for peace with the enemy. 
Because it doesn't matter if I've got 10,000 guys or three guys. Who wins the fight? Thank you. Let's wake up. I know I'm a ranter. Don't sue for peace. Don't count the cost. Count the cost afterwards and go, was it worth it? And the resounding answer should be, yeah, it was absolutely worth it. Don't count the cost lest they mock you and you were unable to finish it. Don't count the cost. Get in the fight. Because I tell you what, when we're all sitting before the Bema seat of Christ, there's only one cost that's counted, and we didn't pay it. So how dare we stand before him who did pay it and say, well, my, my business would have suffered. Uh, don't I deserve to have a new car, new off the lot? I worked hard for that. I'm a good steward of my money, and I'm making sure that I don't waste God's money. It's not ours. Don't count the cost. And when the enemy shows up at our door, do we sue for peace because we don't think we can win? Or do we throw ourselves into the fight? Don't count the cost. Impart the power that saved us to others. And don't fight the enemy. Fight the strongholds thereof. That's the end of my class. I hope you guys appreciated it. I hope you guys got a lesson out of it. I hope you guys looked further than the extreme personality that gave it. Pastor. Right, lots, of, lots of things to think about and actually sets it up really well for what's coming next um, this morning. So thank you very much, Brother Mike. Um, we are in a true battle and the average Christian doesn't know it. And because we don't know it, we don't fight it, we don't engage, and we've lost a lot of ground in our country and the world. So, Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the lessons over the last uh, four weeks, Brother Mike. And I, I pray and ask, Lord, that we would consider individually and as our church whether or not we stand as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And may these lessons be something we chew on, think of, and that the Spirit of God gives us light. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's just take five minutes, grab uh, a drink, whatever you might need. And uh, just a quick announcement, we have some visitors today. All the restrooms inside are for ladies. The men's restroom are, is just outside the, the door. Five minutes and then we'll come back in.